Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Before we begin our program, I'd like to let you know that free newsletters are available from our ministry. Just email us at cdebater at aol.com and give us your mailing address and we'll mail them out to you for free. You can also call us at 512-218-8022 and leave your address there. You can also access all our newsletters online by going to one of our three websites called BibleQuery.org. Once on the homepage, simply click on the Experience box and then scroll down to the newsletter section as shown here. Since our number one most watched video of the over 548 videos we have produced for YouTube at the time of this recording is Unpopular Bible Doctrines number one, The Biblical God No One Wants to Know, with over 433,000 viewings, our latest newsletter is called Unpopular Topic, How Sovereign is God. Our second most viewed YouTube video is Six-Year-Old Wife of Muhammad was okay by the Muslim God Allah, but not by the biblical God of Jesus. With over 341,000 viewings, we also have three newsletters available on Islam. Our video, Debate, Larry Wessels versus Two Jehovah's Witnesses at a University Study Center, currently has close to 150,000 views. See our newsletter on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceive Deceivers. Our video, Is Jesus God Almighty in the Flesh, meaning the second person of the Trinity, or is he something else, has over 101,000 viewings. See our newsletter, Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. Our video, Biography, the famous 19th century Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man of God, has close to 89,000 views. See two of our newsletters with lead articles from sermons by Spurgeon. Our video, UFOs, Ancient Aliens or Beings of the Fourth Dimension, number one, fact or fiction, has over 207,000 viewings. Not only do UFOs and the occult use the same disciplines, such as levitation, teleportation of objects, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, automatic writing, and telepathy, but their theologies are completely foreign to biblical Christianity. UFO theologies include everything from reincarnation and evolution to man achieving cosmic godhood, but they do not include Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We have two newsletters related to the world of the occult to which UFOs are a part. Our video, Former Roman Catholic Bride of Christ, Nun Testifies of Abnormal Life in the Convent, has over 67,000 viewings. Our video featuring former Roman Catholic Rob Zins, who has a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, historical split between Roman Catholicism and the Christ of the Scripture, man's word or God's word, has over 53,000 viewings. See our two newsletters on the subject of Roman Catholicism. Our video, Cult of Ellen G. White, number one, Beginnings of the 19th Century Religion, called Seventh-day Adventism, has over 48,000 viewings and features former Seventh-day Adventist Wallace Slattery, who has 44 years' experience with this religion. Our playlist, called Dealing with Seventh-day Adventism and Their Prophetess, features 15 videos with 14 hours of material. See our newsletter, Seventh-day Adventism, True or False. For theological music lovers, see our video, 
favorite old-time Christian bluegrass gospel music, Psalm 98, verses 4 and 5. With over 214,000 viewings, we have also posted several music videos by my own daughter, Marlena Wessels, from her CD, Win This Fight, songs she has written and performed herself. To see our music videos, please go to our main YouTube channel page. Scroll down to our multiple playlists. Arrow over to our playlist called Our Radio Shows with National Christian Authors and Music Vids. Once there, scroll down to the bottom of the playlist where the music videos are listed. I could go on and on, but this should be sufficient for now. Don't forget to check out our main YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, also which has over 19 playlists by topic as you scroll down our channel page. Now, on with our main presentation. nature and the human nature. Is it possible that when Christ came down and was incarnated that he mingled his divine nature and his human nature into a kind of mixture, a God-man? Well, no. Uh, you cannot mix the two natures. That was an old heresy called the Eudictian or Eutychitan heresy. And uh, okay. the natures yeah. are not divided, but yet they're not confused and they're not mixed. Each are, are separate. Okay, um, also, after we die then, are we just going to be, I guess, perfected human beings, or are we going to be become one with God? Well, like Dave answered that because uh, uh, he's our guest and he knows a lot more than I do. Uh, what does it mean to be like Christ, Dave? We'll see him <laughs> as he is. Yeah, there's a difference between being like Christ and being Christ, <laughs> That's of course. True. Mm -hmm. And going back to the other question just very quickly, could these natures be mingled? I wouldn't even know what it means to mingle them, you know. Uh, and um, we, it says, when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now we see through a glass darkly. So apparently part of what prevents us from being like Christ is we don't really see Christ as he is. We don't really know him in, in the fullness that once we, I mean, that we will uh, know him. Uh, we will be in his image uh, and in his likeness, uh, but we will still be what we are. We will be sinners saved by grace. Uh, we will always sing that song in Revelation 5, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto our God. We will worship God. We will not be God. Um, we will be one with him in the sense that uh, we will desire his will. Uh, we will be totally submissive to him and united with him in spirit. Uh, but uh, and in our desire, in our love, uh, it's like husband and wife. The Bible says they become one. Uh, but they're still distinct. Uh, still a husband, husband and wife. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I believe that's the way it will be in heaven. It will be fantastic. I mean, it's beyond, well, in fact, how can I describe it? Because uh, Paul says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But he has revealed them to us by his spirit. So uh, it's going to be tremendous. We're not going to become gods. We're not going to become God. We will be ourselves, but redeemed and in the likeness of Christ, and no more anything between us, but totally in, in communion and union with Him, in His will, in His love. Great. That, that, that is how I've seen it, and I'll tell you where I'm getting this doctrine from, and maybe 
one of you three gentlemen can uh, have a little information on this group. It's, it's a group, and it's called the Church of Austin. It's called the Local Church, mm. and oh. uh, it's it's they get a they get a lot of their Bible studies sermons from a man named Witness Lee. Oh. Uh, right. Maybe maybe if you could give me some background as I'm trying to take my baby Christian steps to to, to find proper fellowship. If if you could just give me a, some comments, uh, I'd really appreciate it. Okay. Well, Witness Lee has uh, some problems with the Trinity, uh, not understanding the Trinity and the nature of Jesus Christ and salvation. Uh, you need to write us. Uh, we can lay this out for you. Have, write down your questions and we'll research it very well for you and we'll give you the answers for that. But as Dave was saying is that uh, as long as we're in this body right now, uh, Paul called it the body of sin. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And when we die and we're raised again, we'll be raised in, 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 in a new glorified body that's not going to sin. And we're going to be in the moral character and, and in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ in a glorified body, never to sin again. We're going to be in, 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 in one with Him as, as we're built up, as, as Peter says, to a holy temple mm -hmm. uh, with Jesus. And uh, we're not going to become mm -hmm. God. We're, not going to, we're still going to be, I'll know Dave and I'll know What's your name? Dale. Dale. <laughs> and we'll all know each other. Right. And we're not going to just be absorbed in some, some kind of consciousness like the, 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 uh, the New Age and the Buddhists. Right. We're, but we're going the to, Hindus. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be united in love and, and, uh, and we're going to be glorified bodies never to sin again. And so uh, write us about Witness Lee. We get some questions about him, but it's, some of the things are very technical and we can't, you know, uh, explain them very uh, technically on, on the TV right now. But... Thank you for your call. Uh, thank you. Uh -oh. Okay, bye-bye. All go. right, let's uh, go to our next caller. We have John. There's a lot of, like, crop circles and, and like, UFO-type phenomena stuff. Um, do you think demonic spirits are, like, making circles and appearing in the sky? Or what, what is your opinion about that kind of stuff? Okay. Well, we're going to go on, but uh, I'll have Dave answer your question. Thank you for your call. Dave? I was, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C. at a UFO convention. Actually, they invited me there to participate. I was on a panel. Yeah. Uh, these people uh, believe they've been taken aboard UFOs. They're in touch with these beings. Uh, they're <clears throat> they've got their own spirit guides and so forth. Um, U UFOs could be hallucination, uh, mistake, and identity. Uh, they could be demonic. They're not. Uh, they're either demons or angels, or Satan or God. But um, crop circles, um, you know, I've, I've studied it a bit. Uh, uh, there are some amazing things that happen. Animals that are lying out in the snow, they've had their genitals, their, 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 their uh, organs cut out of them. There's no, not a drop of blood in, in, in the body, and there's no footprints. Uh, in the snow. One of those animals was thrown right up in the front door of NORAD, you know, in Colorado, just to show the power of these beings. They're, uh, they're, it's demonic, in, in my opinion. Um, I would just uh, mention, uh, oh, oh, we got to get off this fast, but uh, uh, Jacques Vallée, he's the real-life scientist that Monod, uh, uh, not Monod, uh, uh, Colomb, in Close Encounters was patterned after. He's an astrophysicist and, and so forth. Uh, and um, in his fifth book, I think it was, or sixth book on the subject, it's called Messengers of Deception. He says four things about UFOs. They're real. I mean, too many people have seen them. Um, and, and entire SWAT teams uh, in Georgia, uh, in Atlanta, saw one big as a football field right over their heads one evening. I mean, they all witnessed it. And it, suddenly it took off. <laughs> at incredible speed, but it didn't make any noise. So they're real. They've been seen by too many experts, chased by fighter pilots, seen by our astronauts, fallen on, on, on radar. But they're not, they're not physical. Uh, we got a lot of reasons why. 7,000 miles an hour make a 90 degree turn. Well, you'd fall apart if you were a physical object. You, you couldn't do that. A lot of reasons why they're not physical. And he, by the way, he's an agnostic. He comes at it just purely from his scientific research. They are messengers of deception, and that's the title of that book. Uh, and uh, he says, finally, the fourth thing he says about them, they are psychologically setting up the human race for some 
ultimate deception that is too horrible even to imagine as yet. Hmm. And I, I, I would agree with that. Well, I would say that uh, one of the telltale signs is these UFOs come across the universe to tell you uh, Jesus Christ was just a man uh, to attack the essentials of Christianity. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. He was a spaceman, and it's just uh, a little suspicious. But Buddha and everybody else is okay. Yeah, but, <laughs> but Buddha, yeah. Jesus. Right. Yeah, right. So, uh, and uh, even the author of Communion says that these uh, these creatures are from another dimension. I would say they are from a spiritual dimension. All right, let's go to Gil. Gil, you're on. Dale, how you doing, bud? How you doing? Pretty good. Mr. Krill? Hello. Mr. Hunt, how you doing? Fine. Um, you had a caller that was on the air earlier that mentioned that his family wasn't too excited about him changing his den denomination. I believe he was, was, was he coming from a Catholic background or something? You right. saw this whole family. Well, I can't, I had the same problem with my family. I believe that once they see that he's sincere in his belief, that he tries to walk with Christ, and he does this repetitively, repetitively, they will probably later on begin to see that he's serious about it and, and probably accept it more. But as, as far as something that's new to the family like this, I can understand where he's coming from. So you have a Catholic background? You're a Christian now and you have a, you have yeah, a Catholic family? Yeah, this has family. been five years ago. Okay. And, 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 and it's has, taken every bit of five years. Has, and your family has come around? They've, they've, ex, they've accepted the fact that, well, let me just say they've accepted my destination, maybe not my denomination. Okay. They realize it's not just a fad, too, right? Amen. Well, thank you for your call. Okay. Thank Appreciate you, that testimony. All right. All right. And uh, okay. we're going to quick try to get to uh, Eddie. Eddie, you're on. Hey, how y'all doing? Hello. Doing good. My question is, is because um, I had a Catholicism guy come up to me one time at my job, and he came up with me with the uh, scripture in Revelation 12, verse 1. And while he was saying that, he was sharing this uh, picture of Mary, and, and he's saying that that scripture is all talking about Mary. And, and uh, at that time, I didn't know how to reply back, but I just wanted some insights of what that scripture is really saying. I mean, I know it's not a, it's saying like he was saying, like it's exalting Mary and like the way he was saying, but I was just wondering if you could, ex you know. Well, let me read it real quick and then let Dave right, thank get you. after it. Thank and you. a great yeah. sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child and she cried out, being in labor, in pain to give birth. Well, you go back to Joseph and you've got the same imagery of the sun and the moon and the 12 stars the 12 tribes of Israel. I think this is Israel. And uh, this is one of the things in, in uh, Revelation that goes into the past and then brings you again into the future. She's about to give birth to a child, obviously the Messiah. Uh, it's depicting anti-Semitism down uh, through, through the ages that Satan is there to devour. Uh, if he can destroy the woman or if he can destroy her, the, her seed, uh, the, the Messiah, then he's won his battle with God. Uh, so, and of course, Israel into the future is going to come in for uh, these trials that it's talking about. A few minutes. What, uh, what would you say to the Roman Catholic that thinks it's the Roman Catholic Church that's giving birth to... Or Mary. Or Mary, yeah. yeah be, you know, I've heard that, the, yeah. that Mary isn't even mentioned in any of the epistles. She's not. Huh. She's not mentioned in the epistles. Well, uh, Mary doesn't run off and flee and hide in the wilderness, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's in heaven with the Lord. Right. Uh, Is she the her queen soul, of heaven? No. Is her, she's floating around. Her soul and spirit. And <laughs> she's not out on the astral plane appearing to people. Uh, I mean, the apparitions is very clear. I'll try to get one more call here. But the apparitions is very clear by what they say. For example, Our Lady of Medjugorje uh, says all religions are one. Our, Our Lady of Fatima uh, says that millions of souls die and perish and go to hell because there's no one to make sacrifice for them. Uh, I thought Jesus made the sacrifice. So you can tell from what they say that this is not the real Mary and it's not of God, it's demonic. The facts of history, the facts of the Bible. What does the Bible say? Not my word or uh, Robert Fastigi's word, but what does the Word of God have to say on this subject? And we want to examine it together in a, a pleasantly, uh, lovingly, in a, you know, kind manner. We're not going to have a fight, and we're not going to get mad at one another, and I would uh, certainly welcome Catholics. I hope Catholics would, would come. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, people, uh, of course, our show, we give evidence for uh, the existence of God, and uh, logically there can be only one truth. Uh, Buddha didn't die for your sins. Muhammad didn't die for your sins. Jesus Christ died for your sins. And the Bible has many evidences, prophecy, archaeology, uh, internal consistency, and what God has shown us in His Word is that, that you must surrender your life to Jesus Christ and be born again. You know, Rob, it's, it's been a really pet peeve with me for a long time, and is that how we've downplayed the powerful salvation of God in America. It's, it's amazing to me. If, Americanized Christianity. Yeah. If, if God has saved you, why would you want us to stay? Why would yeah. you want to stay? If God has saved you, why would you want to stay? My parents used to be yeah. religious, and when I really got saved, all of a sudden they said I was in a cult, right. you know, just like that. And sure. I hadn't done anything but, you right. know, I'd get drunk and get arrested and whatever. <laughs> you know, I thought that would make them happy. would have if I hadn't started telling them about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, uh, in Romans said that the gospel is what? The power. 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 What kind of God do we have that, that has no power to, to and, and Paul in Thessalonians says, your faith is spread throughout the, the Roman Macedonia is that in the first place you turn from your idols, you turn from your religion. You burned your books you, in Ephesus. Yeah, you turn and you went away from your family right. and you were under persecution and they mm -hmm. took your goods and you did this and, mm -hmm. and we, we kind of now have a... Have a we make yeah. Hebrews 11 a bad testimony. Yeah. But, <laughs> I don't know the answer yeah. to it, but I just know that the Bible uh, says that, that God is powerful, that He, the Spirit comes into your heart and you cry out, Abba, Father, and you're His, you're united in Christ, and you're a new creature, and He says all these other things you forget, and these things that come to you now are from God, and I just, I just don't see it. I can see how you can, after you're a Christian, how you see in the New Testament, not so much the ones that are you know, still in the idols or something, they said, beware of those, but in the New Testament you see people coming in to twist the doctrine, right. to change you. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, I believe in this, but add this, or, or do this and this, or go back to the old Jewish ways. You have that, mm -hmm. and you have people being confused, and, and then, you know, Paul had not write letters, and Jesus hadn't rebuked the churches for not standing firm. You have that. You have the, the Judaizers and the false prophets and apostles going in there, and, and that's where you have to have sound teaching and doctrine, which the church mm -hmm. doesn't want that now because we want a Christianity like an M&M. Mm -hmm. No chocolate mess, you know? Yeah. But Rob, I wanted to ask you, in the, in the Christianity in America today, there is a coming together with Roman Catholicism. We'll quickly tell the people why we should not do this. I mean, uh, you've said already Roman Catholicism is a false gospel mm -hmm. that will basically, that will not, not basically, that will damn a person, lead them to hell. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we shouldn't combine with that, mm -hmm. but I don't think a lot of the people really understand that. Well, it's not just Roman Catholicism that we shouldn't combine with. There are a number of religions that we should have nothing to do with because they deny the gospel of Jesus Christ, but since I'm in the field working all the time on the Roman Catholic question, just let me say briefly that uh, there are a number of evangelicals across the nation who seem to want to push an ecumenical movement back toward Rome, and they're doing so really out of either ignorance for our own precious gospel or out of ignorance of the gospel that Rome preaches and teaches. And all I can say to this is that we need to be better students of the scriptures. We need to be better at standing up and defending the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we need to resist all such pressure and efforts. The reason behind the pressure, behind the efforts to ecumenize the nation and bring us back with Rome can be summed up by one word, fear. Evangelicals have a fear of being taken over by secular humanists, a fear of being taken over by atheists, a fear of being taken over by Far Eastern religions, a fear of being taken over by black Muslims, a fear of being taken over by the Muslim religion, a fear of being taken over by New Age groups. And they're looking for allies in their fear. And uh, it's very similar to uh, the, the people of uh, Israel who were called out of Egypt and at one point they wanted to go back and find an ally in Egypt that would protect them. And folks, we can't go back to Rome 
Rome apostatized in the 1500s. Rome is a false hope. It possesses in her heart a false gospel. And because of that, if we're thinking clearly, we would not have any part of Rome, never mix the gospel with Rome. But because of this overwhelming fear in our society of being overrun by secular humanism, Far Eastern religions, and the general chaotic mess that our society is in, we're getting pushed back toward Rome to find an ally that uh, ultimately will spell the death of the gospel. If you want to lose your gospel, merge with a religion that doesn't have one, and soon it'll be gone. But I really think that that's the chief reason why evangelicals are moving back toward Rome. That in flat out ignorance. Mm -hmm. Somebody once said the church in America is 3,000 miles wide and about a half an inch deep. And it may be that that's our problem. There's precious mm -hmm. little theological training. Uh, let's go to Thomas. Thomas, you're on. How you doing, sir? Hello. Doing good. I have a question. It's around the area of uh, determinism. Mm -hmm. Could you um, explain to me, um, I guess, Calvin's view of redemption and determinism as opposed to evangelical uh, view? Uh, gee, Rob, you think you can do that? <laughs> I might be able to do that a little bit. Uh, the word determinism is a loaded word and a dangerous word because uh, determinism, like fatalism, presupposes that all things that come to pass come to pass in accordance with the process of some natural law that is chaotic and out of control and impersonal. So we really don't like to use the word determinism because it has behind it an impersonal force that guides the universe. Calvin would have nothing to do with determinism. What he had everything to do with was predestination and foreordination of all events by a very personal God who is moving all of history in the direction that he wants it to go, working out all things after the counsel of his will and in full control of each and every aspect of the universe that he has created. So Calvin was not a determinist. Calvin was a predestinarian. And there's a world of difference between the two. One is impersonal forces guiding the universe. The other is a very personal God who is working out all things after the counsel of his will. And Calvin would be the first one to stand up and say that we must yield to the sovereignty of this God, though we don't understand this God totally, though we cannot comprehend his ways entirely, for we are finite and God is infinite, yet we are to bring ourselves to the point of submission to his sovereign will and trust that God is just in all that he does and God is good in all that he does and God is working out all things to his predetermined end. Does that help you at all? Yes, it does. But if, if first, uh, I want um, me to ask a question about, well then what, how does, um, let's see, how does the plan of salvation is that it's given freely and, and that it's uh, a choice that man must make coincide with God's uh, predestined will. In other words, is mm -hmm. man um, free to make a choice or has God made that choice for him prior to his even coming to exist? Uh, man, man's choice is very free and very real in the sense of his being a free agent. But by definition, man can never be totally free for to be totally free, he would have to be God. You see that man is limited in his free choice by virtue of being created, by virtue of being raised, for instance, in a certain part of the country, by virtue of being male or female, by virtue of being so far up on the intelligence scale or so far down, by virtue of having physical limitation. Man's lack of ultimate and total freedom is a well-known and established fact. Man cannot stop sinning. Man cannot fly. Man cannot understand the universe on his own. He's not free, you see. There's only one who is free, and that is God. But this God, whom we worship, in his sovereignty has ordained both the end and the means to accomplish the end. Thus it is that he has determined the salvation of all those who will believe, and he has also determined that they will exercise the freedom that he has given them as creatures to choose him. Will they choose him? Yes. Can they not? 
No. Must they? Yes. How so? By virtue of the free agency that they are given. So man's choices are real, and they are free in a limited sense, but they can never be totally free. And the, the myth in theology is the myth of free will. Man does not have free will, for to have free will, he would have to be absolutely and totally unbiased, either from without or from within, in every decision he makes. And that's an impossibility because of the fall of Adam and the depravity in which man is born. He is biased from within, bondage to his will, his nature, and cannot choose God until God first chooses him. So, uh, in answer to your question, God determines all things and man has free agency to choose, but not freedom of will to choose. Okay, see, and I, I think that's what I'm, I, I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. How is it that he could even choose if God has already chosen? Uh, he hasn't really made a choice in if God has already chosen for him to, to redeem him and his choice is only what? I mean, what, how can that really be a choice? If uh, he has made a choice, he just hasn't made an unbiased choice. You see, if you sit down and have a, a chicken in front of you or a steak in front of you and you choose the steak, I'll ask you why. And you say, I wanted to, I'll ask you, why did you want to? And you say, you like steak better, and I'll ask you why. And you'll say, well, it tastes better to me. And then I'm going to say, well, then you're biased towards steak. Were you really free to choose that steak just because you were biased? Yes. But was it a totally free choice? No. You were biased in that choosing. You see, remember, ultimate freedom must be done in perfect equilibrium. You cannot be biased from within or from without when you make that choice if you want to make it freely. Only God has absolute freedom to choose because he is totally unbiased and he is absolute in equilibrium when he makes his choices. He is not under any kind of external or internal compulsion when he chooses. Therefore, when you choose, no matter what you choose, you choose in a biased sense because you are always being bombarded with data from outside and data from inside that make you make that choice. Outside There's no such in, thing outside influences. as a free choice. Yeah. Right. Outside and inside influences. Oh, we've got to run There's along, no Thomas. Free choice. We're running out of time. We went to get to other calls. good one to read on that is uh, Martin Luther, Bondage of the Will. And if you don't like that, read Jonathan Edwards, The Freedom of the Will. What about R.C. Sproul? The name or R.C. Sproul, Chosen <laughs> by God, or any number of uh, good works on that. Thank well, you for the call, Thomas. Okay? Good, good question. Thank you. Right. This theological moment was brought to you by... Right? <laughs> no. All right. Well, they asked. <laughs> that's right. right. That's right. All yeah. right. With that, let's go to Steve. Steve, you're here. You're on. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hello. I uh, appreciate your program. I uh, get a lot of good information from it. Thank you. Um, Appreciate Robert being there this evening. He answers questions in a calm and uh, unemotional uh, way, and appreciate that. Yeah. My question is on uh, um, age of accountability and how it's uh, the doctrine of the age of accountability and how it is uh, scripturally supported. And I'm not sure if you uh, accept that uh, doctrine or not. Uh, well, the question is, if I say I believe in Yeshua rather than Jesus, is that acceptable to you? If you believe that Yeshua is the God-man, yeah. if that you believe that Yeshua is who he was, that he, that he is the only way, and that uh, he was uh, God in the flesh, second person of the Trinity, sure. the God-man, that he died for your sins, rose from the dead, and that uh, you must accept him as your Lord and Savior, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Because as, Jesus as long as is just it's one in the same, right? Equal, person. I mean, it's, the same as Jesus, as we know the word Jesus. Right. It's who he scripture. is, not not necessarily uh, whether it's Greek or Hebrew Hebrew name. Right. Okay. The, and the second comment, if I may, uh, there was a there was a scripture given earlier on the second coming, and there's a scripture in uh, Hebrews nine twenty six right. regarding the reason of the second coming, right. not for salvation, uh, but it says. To and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, right. but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Right. So second coming is also f to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Right. Now, to my original question is, um, I'm not sure if you support the doctrine of the age of accountability when someone is accountable to God. You can't find it in the Bible. 
Well, uh, I think we need to flesh that out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, in the Roman Catholic religion, the age of accountability is generally somewhere around seven or eight or nine years old, and they believe that that's when a person becomes culpable for his or her personal sinning. Uh, prior to that, the, uh, the sacrament of, of baptism covers and washes away uh, original sin and holds the child in a state of innocence. And if that child should die before the age of accountability, then they would go to heaven having had their original sin washed away in baptism. If that's what you mean by an age of accountability, then absolutely not. There is no shred of evidence in Scripture for that doctrine. It's uh, wishful thinking on the part of man and entirely arbitrary. But if by an age of accountability you mean are all men accountable in this age for the sin of Adam and thus condemned in Adam, Yes, we do live in an age of accountability for Christ that uh, came that they might know their sins. And uh, well, his, his coming leaves us in an age of accountability. So what did you mean by age of accountability? Um, some denominations that I've um, um, had dialogue with say do not accept, they're not Roman Catholic. They are, they are the denominations who do not uh, do infant baptism. Right. And they say there is an age of accountability for oh. a person. Okay. Uh, that, that would be, uh, I understand what you're saying now, that would be more of your Pelagian and uh, semi-Pelagian um, professing Christians who do not have us condemned in Adam after the cross. They would believe that Jesus' death on the cross eliminated all condemnation in Adam, and now a person is only condemned for his or her own sins, and those sins are only held against them at the point of the age of accountability. We would deny that and uh, insist that all are condemned in Adam, even at birth, as a baby, and their condemnation is sure and they are no more or less condemned at age one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven because they are dead in Adam, uh, having had Adam's sin and guilt imputed to them from uh, Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21. So no, we would not hold to that at all. Most, most of that, uh, my discussion is with like independent Baptist congregations or people in independent Baptist congregations. Right. Uh, I'm particular. I'm a Christian worshiping in a Lutheran denomination. Right. Okay. Luther did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Luther was strong on uh, our our uh, our association with Adam's sin, but yeah. he, uh, he he did also hold to uh, infant baptism. I understand. I, I don't know where he would have stood on the age of accountability, but we certainly, uh, in light of Romans chapter five, we cannot uh, possibly hold to accountability for personal sins only. And that's all accountability is about. We hold that all are condemned in Adam and lost sure. from birth forward. But maybe you can explain what what your what you see in Scripture, or all of you see in Scripture, as to when someone is accountable to God, mm. when they will be held accountable. They, they they are already condemned and held accountable in Adam. You I see, I understand that. Yes. I agree with that. Now, they don't know that until a certain age, until someone tells them, gives them the gospel, gives them the word. Right. But they are nevertheless accountable. I understand. I understand. Even, even though they don't know they're accountable. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I'm okay. not disagreeing with you. I understand. Well, I would, I would say that, that it comes to a point, if you're saying when they can understand it, the, uh, the, the law or whatever, the, the, the word spoken law, I mean... Uh, the Word of God says they have the work of the law in their hearts, even when they're little kids. When they punch their little sister, they feel bad about it, so they know they've broken it. But it, I believe, you know, if it comes to a point, uh, it talks about in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if you're saying that there's a point in somebody's life where they can understand, I, I would know. Some kids understand a lot earlier than others, and some are a lot later. Uh, that would be the only thing I would say. You know, I wouldn't see any way you can pin it down. Yeah, the Bible is not uh, real clear. In fact, the Bible doesn't talk about that. We just know God is just. 
Uh, some people want to allude to where David said that um, he would see his son in heaven uh, when he was taken away. And uh, of course the doctrine of infant baptism was, was built uh, around uh, this idea of what's going to happen to the children. And then of course it says, okay, we'll baptize them, you know. But uh, the Bible never speaks about any of this. It just says that we're, we're all dead in our sins from Adam and um, accountable to God, and we need Jesus Christ. He's the only way. In the womb, accountable in the womb. Well, what I came to my mind, if, if God had written in the Bible and said that, that people aren't accountable to me uh, till they're, let's say, two years old, mm -hmm. then there's some sick people that the devil could use and say, it's better for me to kill my baby, and I'm assured he'll go to heaven, then wait till he's two years old. Right. Then be mm -hmm. accountable to God. Mm -hmm. So I think God left it intentionally as a mystery to us, but yet He's showed us His 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 uh, His mercy and who He is. And I'm rather leave it in His hands than than have Him say, "Well, okay, if you're three years old, you're accountable." And I know how wicked people are, and how Satan could turn it, saying, "Well, let's have all mass murder," because I know my other son grew up to be a, a mm -hmm. drunkard and mm -hmm. all that. I'm not going to let this one grow up and right. be a drunkard and go to hell. This so is, I'm going to kill my, my, a, my uh, child and I know he'll go to heaven because the Bible right, says he right, will. Because right. it's not he's not three years old yet. There it, was no, no question in David's mind. He said, I was brought forth in iniquity. Steve, we're going to try to get one more caller in. Thank you very much. Right. Appreciate your call. And we all know that what was raining in that. Go ahead, Alice. See, uh, hi. Um, uh -huh. I had a question. My question was that when when God put the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. did he already know that Adam and Eve were going to sin, or was it a 50-50 chance? Uh oh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to answer that, and then we're going to have to sign off. Thanks okay, for your call. Thank there. you. Yeah. Well, go he, ahead. He briefly. absolutely knew that Adam and Eve was going to sin, and the, the reason he knew they were going to sin is because he determined that they would sin. Remember, you're dealing with a God that does not arrive at knowledge. Nothing takes God by surprise. God is perfect and he is omniscient and he creates all things for his own will and his purposes. Uh, for Adam and Eve to be put in the garden and for God to have to wait to arrive at the knowledge of their behavior would be a limitation on yeah. God's omniscience and omnipotence. Uh, God knew exactly what he was doing right. in the creation of Adam and Eve. He knew exactly that they would sin and he knew exactly yes. the remedy for sin, and he brings it all forth for his glory because uh, that's the that's purpose right. of mankind. That's right, and because he let man fall and he can show his love and redemption through Jesus Christ. So we know there's a God because of the creation. Something can't come out of nothing, so something always was. There's an eternal, intelligent, holy God by the design in the universe, and he has communicated truthfully, and, and we know we're sinners. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear from You, 
Jesus is and others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -E -S -S in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at AOL.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the Jesus